election. And you may even hear some of your own perspective in each of the three voices that we are honored to have on the stage with us today. The first, to my far left, is Mr. Meyer Chambers. Meyer is the camp uh, hold, okay. Meyer's the campus minister at Boston College, and his direct connection is with the Sisters of St. Joseph of Boston. He serves on the board for Regis College. I I'm told he's very shy, so. And next, someone who probably doesn't need an introduction to many of us, and that is Helen Carney. Helen uh, has been a college professor, but currently she is in the Ministry of Leadership. She is the president of the Congregation of Brentwood. And certainly, I want to say last but certainly not least, our third panelist is Erin McDonald. And Erin is a member of the Congregation of Joseph, and she currently ministers at Freedom House Shelter. So without further ado. And be kind to them, because they were all so lovely when I asked and invited them to be on this panel. And I was told to tell you that Mary owes me big time. <laughs> Um, I, as, as Mary has said, I'm the president of the Sisters of St. Joseph of Brentwood. Uh, we are a congregation of over 480, uh, a diocesan congregation serving quite locally in uh, the, the boroughs of New York, Suffolk County, in Puerto Rico, and a few places other and farther away. But we are a diocesan and rather parochial group. However, um, our mother house, like for many of you, uh, is large. Uh, 211 acres might give you a perspective on that. Uh, many buildings uh, that used to house novitiate, junior eight, college, all those wonderful things that are no longer needs. But at this point in our history, they are actually serving many other needs. And Mary Johnson asked us when uh, she contacted us as responders, uh, to answer that question, you know, where, what is God calling us to, and where is God in all of this? And I could really just say two words and then pass it over to uh, my cohorts here. But bottom line for us is I think it is to be attentive. And it's not something that we're beginning. It's something that we've been doing for a very long time. But combined with that attentiveness is to be open. Uh, we've been looking to serve the dear neighbor, a phrase, a part of our tradition that is very powerful for all of us. To serve the dear neighbor without distinction, to serve the greatest needs. I think one of the things that we need to be attentive to is looking to how we serve those needs, not only in the ways we think they need to be served, only, not only in the ways that we think these are the needs, but really to be open to listening and talking to the people who surround us to help us truly understand what the needs are and how we might meet them. This is not new for us. Um, I'll give you two simple examples in our own congregation, um, one definitely grounded in our mother house a large academy, no longer an academy for women and girls. The need in Brentwood, 68% Latino population, very strong population, mostly from Central America. Women who needed to learn English. So 25 years ago, our educational background brought us to meet that need by providing English as a second language. But listening to those women, they needed more than the language. Helping them with health care, parenting, connection to social services. That's been going on for over 25 years. In our diocese, large convents, vacant, 
women coming from prison, women and children who needed shelter, Providence House in our congregation over 25 years opening the doors where sisters companioned those women and children. Less sisters to do that, more people collaborating with us, co-ministers, other agencies to keep that service of the need going. One of the things that I, I think is important for us to realize is that sense of collaboration and connecting. Um, one of the things that we've found uh, recently in Long Island, we have a very large number of undocumented children, the unaccompanied. So big mother house, you know, just put them up, bring them in and we'll take care of them. That's not what they needed. They needed help and support for legal services. So by talking to others, listening to the, those who really do have the need, we took another path with that. As Mary uh, has presented so clearly, the demographics in our, our church and nation are, are changing drastically. And I mentioned to you, uh, certainly on Long Island and where we are uh, in our mother house, 68% Latino population, but even in New York City, a very diverse population. In order to connect and in order to learn from the diverse populations where we serve, we have really been given a sign of hope and a sign that we have a greater clarity about our identity in these recent years because of trying to pay attention to what those needs are and also trying to find new ways to minister to them. Aging, we are a median age of 80, but we are blessed with many new members in our congregation. And here among us, we have our co-ministers. We have people working with us in our congregational offices who are carrying us through this time of attention and transition. But I want to say something about aging. It has its limitations, in case anyone in this room doesn't understand that. <laughs> But it's also allowing us to be more present. And I see that with our sisters in our mother house who listen, are present to the people working with us, mostly of Latino background, encouraging them, advising them, giving them time, and hearing from them what their struggles are, and also maybe hearing from them where is God for me? And how can I discern what my life could be in connection with God? Sisters in more active ministries are still in that same mode of presence. Yes, they may be performing tasks and ministering in, in, in the ways that we're somewhat familiar with, but their role is much more to be the encourager, to be the guide, to really understand the people that we are actually working with and for. I think one of the things we've not done too well is we've not been able to speak about our lives, that they are centered in prayer. They're supported by community and we're happy, right? Okay. People see us as busy have no problem with that, but they need to see that we are about more than that. We are also not doing such a great job by talking to people about God in their lives, about choices of a lifestyle that might mean there is a call to religious life. You know, getting called to this panel, you do read Mary's book. <laughs> And Mary mentioned, and, and you see this in the um, NRVC materials, 250,000 women, unmarried women, seriously considered a call to religious life. But don't, we don't know what happened. We haven't had the places for those deeper conversations, spaces to help women discern where God is calling them. Um, one of the things, just very specifically, um, the Atlantic region is here in this room and some of our newer, younger members have gathered. Uh, Mary was uh, a presenter for one of their gatherings 
And out of that, out of that conversation with others, even other Joseph congreg congregations that are here in this room, we had the idea that maybe a volunteer program was something we've talked about for probably 40 years and never moved. We, we decided we should do that. But we're not doing it alone. We're doing it with the Joseph the Worker Group. So here's a whole other network of people. <laughs> we have the space, we have the place. Anybody interested in coming? <laughs> Um, I believe that we are able to continue to engage and listen and encourage women to consider religious life. Uh, we have to be confident that the vowed life is actually a very visible sign of a relationship with God and a relationship with each of our institutes. And it is the sign of our prophetic role that has been inherent in the existence of religious institutes since we began. I believe we're very poised at a moment in time to be that place where conversations, open discussions, experiences in prayer, um, and as in Mary's book, we might have a Maria who comes to be with us means we have to be able to open the door and spend some time to hear and listen to what they're yearning for, what their devotional life might look like that's different than ours. I believe that we can be those joyful, committed women, and we can continue to respond to unserved needs. And I can say this because it might be our 101-year-old encouraging an aide to go back to school. Our youngest member bringing teachers and children to an organic garden to witness and experience the interdependence of all creation. It might be that garden that is adjacent to the farmers who are now leasing land for organic farming in our mother house. It might be one of our sisters joining Simone Campbell on Nuns on the Bus. Be because she and many others have really seen the ravaging effects of homelessness and entering life after imprisonment. It may be people in our schools and parishes forming those values and the, developing the gifts of young people to be a force of change in our society, or it may be the sister holding the dying hand of a person who needs to know God's unconditional love is with them. The key for me is we need to be confident about why we do what we do. Um, right before this gathering, I, I will just end with this, um, I was saying, what, what do we need to say here today? So I picked up um, the uh, daily pr prayer, the liturgy reading of the day. <laughs> and just so, in case you don't remember, on Friday it said, we are going out in the midst of wolves to be led before governors and kings as witness before them. I didn't think that was too inviting. <laughs> but it is to be on the edge. Not, not, we must be more. We must be and live the more of the gospel. That passage goes on, and this is where I think we need to find our hope. You will be given at that moment what you are to say. For it will not be you who speak, but the Spirit speaking through you. The need is there, the call is loud, and we need to be open and responsive. So I end with a quote from Paul Molinari, a Jesuit. You must be generous in throwing the seed with open hands without becoming discouraged when the fertile soil seems sparse. God, on the other hand, would have us sow generously, extravagantly, even wastefully, wherever we find ourselves. We can afford to, knowing full well that God is the keeper of the harvest. We are the sowers, and as such, we need concern ourselves solely with this. How wide is the arc of our throw? How open are our hands? Thank you.
Well, uh, <laughs> I wanted to go first. <laughs> There are perhaps three intellectuals that I've heard speak in my lifetime who have a stream of consciousness that just draws me to the end of my chair as I, sp as I listen to them speak. The first was uh, Carnell West, who spoke at the National Association of Independent Schools People of Color Conference, I believe it was 1997, in St. Louis. The man spoke for an hour behind a podium and never used a note. And then there was J. Brian Hare, who spoke uh, of, of sociological situations around the world as far as the churches are concerned, in juxtaposition to the number of mailboxes there are on street corners. Don't ask me to recount that. And then there's Mary Johnson, who every time I hear her speak just draws me to a different place. Would you agree? Now, to put, I, I'm not as organized as my distinguished colleague over here, so you're going to have to listen to me ramble a little bit because I was told I was to respond to Mary's talk. Um, to put this in perspective a little bit, um, last night, uh, a very dear friend of mine who's here in the room uh, came to me and said, I, I looked for you earlier at your table, and he said, more than me, you should be pretty obvious in this room, basically, <laughs> but I couldn't find you. And I guess when Mary spoke about visibility versus invisibility, it sort of put it in context for me. I grew up in New Orleans, and pretty much everyone in my neighborhood in the Seventh Ward was black and Catholic, or so I thought. It wasn't until much later when I reflected on who my neighbors were, because we were all pretty close. Uh, it was a great place to grow up during those days. Uh, people really looked out for each other. They looked out for their children. Our families lived very close to each other. I had an aunt around the corner. My grandfather was around the other corner. Um, but I always thought, because the rosary took place in our house every third Monday night of the month, the whole neighborhood came for the rosary. you got to understand. And there was a traveling Mary that went around to everywhere. <laughs> you just thought, assumed that everyone was a Catholic, but it wasn't so. And if you look closely at who made up our little block, there were people of other denominations, but we were all black. And then I think about the fact that just behind my house, on the street behind us, was a Baptist church. A block away was a congregational church. Two blocks away was a holiness church. And if you opened up the back door on a Sunday afternoon about 2 o'clock, you could tell there was a holiness church two blocks away, amen? So you fast forward to my life as it is now. I work at Boston College, as you heard, that's my primary position, 15,000 students, 9,600 of them are undergraduates, and I get the privilege of working with the music ministry there. I have about 85 students in a group. Uh, very few students of color in that group. I also have the privilege of working at a high school uh, for about 300 boys, which my two sons attended. Um, it, I believe tuition is up to $41,000 a year now. It's an independent school, but it's, the, hey, don't hate. Somebody has to go to that school. I was privileged to have two boys graduate from there. But my point is, there are about 15% or less students of color in the school, and very few of them are Roman Catholics. I direct a diocesan choir, the, uh, the Archdiocese of Boston Black Catholic Choir. By intention, that's the name of the group. They're not all black, and they're not all Catholic. 
We're talking about demographics here, right? And then I work in an urban parish in the heart of Boston, Grove Hall, formerly St. John's Church, sorry, St. Hugh's Church. In the 60s, it became St. John's St. Hugh's Church. And in the mid-2000s, it became St. Catherine Drexel Church. As you can see, like other places around the country, we have constantly been combining, 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 downsizing, switching things around. The demographics have changed from the Irish parish there, that it was, where there were, let's say, five masses on a Sunday and everyone was packed, to three masses now, where the first one on Sunday we serve about 50 people, the second one at 10 o'clock serves maybe 200 people. And the third mass at 1 p.m. in the afternoon is a totally different community of Nigerian people, mostly Igbo. Now, I'm laying this picture out for you because all three of those masses are pretty much populated by black people, even though there are people of other races who come. In the population, and this might be fodder for another book, Mary, the, the, the sociological breakdown is phenomenal. Again, New Orleanian, cradle Catholic, everybody's black and Catholic, right? Educated by the Sisters of the Blessed Sacrament and the Josephite Fathers. Moved to Boston. Some people are people who have emigrated from the south to the north. There's some people who are from the Caribbean. And then you have this Nigerian population, which is huge. But inside of the Nigerian population, there's a hierarchy as well. Maybe hierarchy is not the proper word for that. There's a diversity within the diversity. It's a primarily Igbo con congregation. But the second chaplain to that community in the early 90s, or late 90s perhaps, was Yoruba. If you're not Nigerian, you may not understand what I'm saying. This is an Igbo con congregation being ministered to by a Yoruba man. That's huge. I had a conversation at my table earlier this morning with one of the sisters from Boston about racism in our communities. And I'm not talking about our cities. I'm talking about in our religious communities and how we treat each other. And is it intentional or is it by accident? How do we get there? How does a Yoruba man interact with an Igbo community that really doesn't recognize him as one of them? How did the Italians, sisters of St. Joseph of Boston, survive in a predominantly Irish community? How did St. John St. Hugh Parish, a bastion of Irish Catholics, get to be ministered to ultimately by a black Catholic musician from New Orleans? I find it fascinating I find it fascinating when we talk about, or Mary talks about, slide two, if you will remember back, and the rapid change with what's happening with the numbers of sisters that are coming to the communities and their makeup. That slide was from 2010. This is 2016. 
And as you know, how quickly your communities are changing. Can you imagine what that slide would look like if it was done today? That made an impact on me. This whole experience has made an impact on me. I know I have only 10 minutes. So I guess where, I'm, where, I, want, where I fall down on all of this, visibility and invisibility within the community has to be intentional. We have to look at each other and see each other for who we are. If the communities are changing according to the way the statistics say they are, why don't I see them in this room? I know I just put my foot in it. It is the elephant in the room for me. And you know, this isn't the first time that I've been the only man, black man, in a room of white people. But I'm okay with that because even though it's not about race, it's about our Catholic connection. I've worked primarily in white institutions since I was educated by the Sisters of the Black Blessed Sacrament at the only historic black Catholic college in the United States. Do you know where that is? Have you heard of it before? Xavier University of Louisiana. Not the Jesuit one. <clears throat> Please don't tell the president I said that. I like my paychecks. My point is, you know that, that saying that people say, well, when I see you, I don't see color. That is the most offensive thing you can say to anybody what, uh, whatsoever. My father and my mother gave me this beautiful color. Yeah. So I want you to see it. I want you to embrace it. I want to embrace what you are. I want you to embrace who you are. And I want, to embrace, I want us to embrace each other. So I think if there's anything that can calm the waters about the, the major changes that are happening in the communities, I think it is to embrace each other just as the dear neighbor, but as the dear sister and the dear brother. Thank you. Good morning. I have a couple of thoughts and reflections that I would like to share some of which are the fruit of having some conversation with some of my peers during the break. So I had the opportunity to, to get some additional feedback from folks that I can integrate into some of what I'd like to share or some questions I'd like to put out to all of us this morning. Um, one first initial thought I had was connected to a program that I have the privilege of being a part of through Loyola University in New Orleans and the Hilton Foundation. I am a part of a, a, a graduate program in pastoral ministry that is put together with a community, uh, five communities of sisters from all over the world. So there's a handful of us from the US and then sisters from Vietnam and Tanzania and Latin America, um, many countries around the world. Now the program has its challenges, as you can imagine, with language and culture and so forth. But at its heart, it really emphasizes for me the idea, the importance, the need for a greater perspective, a larger perspective of our global sisterhood. And especially for us um, uh, newer members, I think this is going to be a very poignant reality for our future. Um, that moving forward, how do we become more connected with our sisters around the globe? And not just sisters of St. Joseph, 
but the entire family of women religious around the world. And technology helps to erase some of those borders. It helps us to connect and build relationships in ways that were not available before. Um, and in terms of our different charisms and cultures, it can absolutely propose uh, challenges. However, there's one fundamental commonality that runs through all of our lives as women religious. Uh, the call to love, the call to service, and the call to gospel living. And um, that was really moving in me as I was preparing for, for this this morning to just really highlight um, the desire in me and in many newer members to really find ways to connect more broadly inter-community, uh, globally, with our family of, of women religious. Um, in terms of some thoughts related to uh, younger, newer members and or um, perhaps uh, college students and St. Joseph the Worker, other folks who may be present here in the room, some sense of what I think moves among us is a real desire to live counterculturally. In a, in a, especially in the United States right now, as, as other speakers have mentioned, there is this real feeling of division happening in our culture, particularly in our country, but in many places in our world, this real sense of, of we're turning on each other. And in the political realm, um, in terms of violence, discrimination, whether it's racial discrimination or because of sexuality, um, Islamophobia, gun violence, that there's a real sense of pain for me in seeing and feeling how much we are creating violence against each other. And this um, quote was running around in my head. I follow uh, On Being through NPR, and they often have wonderful podcasts and written reflections. There was one by Parker Palmer in which he wrote, violence is what happens when suffering has nowhere else to go. And the call for us to cultivate a supple heart so that my suffering can be transformed into compassion instead of violence. And I feel that that's a place where our charism really lives, is how am I how are we bringing to our world a place where people can turn their suffering into compassion and help reduce violence in our world? Um, another resource that might be interesting through the Huffington Post, there's a, a story, a, a video and an article about a former CIA agent. She gives an interview. And the interview is based off of learning to listen to your enemy because everyone thinks they are the good guy. So if you have a chance to look that up, it's another wonderful resource for this, this essence of um, the, the desire to be countercultural and how do we become better listeners to each other? How do we become uh, vessels for love and for change in our, our world and in our communities? Um, so the other thoughts that I would like to share um, is related to some of the discussions this morning about uh, generations or age cohorts. And some of the, the fruit of conversation, particularly this morning, but certainly a running thread through my experiences and the gift time of being with other peers and new members, is a real need and a real desire to feel as though we have a voice at the table. And it can be challenging because we are often so few, we are often so spread out, that it can be challenging for us to be heard and to have a voice. And the question to put forward is how, I don't know the answer, but how can we create venues that help the, the newer member voice to be heard 
and we need help from the majority cohort to make that happen. Um, some other, you know, thoughts that were going around is there's also a real need for, for us to have a space to come together and be able to share and build relationships and to start cultivating a sense of dreaming about our future. So there's a lot of silos of groups that are functioning, but many of them, um, you know, we have sort of leaders as Levin as a group, we have Congregation of St. Joseph has 65 and under, and there are, are numerous different groups, but some of what folks were asking is, is there a way that we can make space for one group, irregardless of whether we've done Leaders as Leaven or whether you're a member of this group or that or in formation or not, is there space for those of us of a certain age cut off and under to, to have time together to really start cultivating that sense of of how do we, we start dreaming, how do we start planning, thinking about, brainstorming, discerning what these movements are that are emerging here in these dramatically changing times. Um, and the other, you know, two things, one, another piece of it being um, in that space of creating, listening, uh, one challenge that that no, younger, newer women religious have shared as an ongoing challenge is that we're very often misunderstood or broadly lumped together. And, um, you know, we were saying that sometimes it's really difficult to be, to be put in this group together. And very often that age bracket, particularly speaking about generations, can be a huge expanse of age. For example, 65 and under. Um, my <laughs> I'm 36 and my parents are in their 50s. Oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it's not any sense of better or worse or good or bad or, or negative, but it's just to say that sometimes it, it's it's a, it's a challenge as we're talking about the differences in the demographics and as Mary Johnson was talking about how there are distinct differences in the, each of these generations in terms of what has formed us and how we've experienced the world. And, um, and so there is a lot that we hold in common as well, that there is the charism, there is our love for, for God and service and our congregations. There, I mean, there is much that we hold in common as well, but there is also um, a need to, to also just bring forth a sense of how are we as a congregation asking more questions to help understand better instead of making statements that feel at times like um, assumptions. You know, we had someone at our table, a number of us newer members were together just talking and um, someone came over and said, oh look, here's our table of millennials. And there's, I don't know, five or six of us were there, but only one at the table was actually a millennial. Um, which, it, you know, the age brackets are similar, but it's just a way of saying, you know, how do we turn it on its head a bit, to, to come from a stance of asking questions to help better understand. Um, because I think it is something as a, a congregation and a charism that is often so important to us is how do we understand each other better? How do we um, build relationships? How do we reach across enormous bridges of differences and bring about um, being catalysts for love. And this is another way of just sort of exploring and teasing out um, how, how do we, as we're talking about generational differences and commonalities and influences, some of the experience of newer members um, in all the ways we are loved and supported and welcomed, there are also just some challenges to find a place for our voice 
and to, to feel um, that there is an essence of wanting to understand and wanting to know and to really cultivate that sense of communal dialogue and conversation so that we can understand each other and the challenge of being a part of that minority group that so often can have difficulty in finding a voice and being heard. And, um, you know, there are ways in which we're trying to create those spaces, but um, just trying to underline some of that um, important need. And the last point that was the fruit of some communal discussion was I would label um, holy recklessness. Um, I really stole it from a publication from Mary Johnson somewhere, but there's also this, this spirit of, as you look at these demographics, you know, some newer members were saying, um, you know, there's huge numbers of sisters in the Northeast, and, um, you know, perhaps were geographically oriented where, it, as Mary was saying, where those demographics for Catholics and the need used to be. But here we are now and that's shifted. And is there space or how do we create space for newer members to really follow the movement of the spirit and to be able to say, is there interest, is there desire for us to move to a different part of the country, to have the ability to, to move um, globally as well as these needs are shifting in our own country and as we are becoming ever more global, is there, are there ways that we can create those spaces for newer members um, to really live into a bit of that holy recklessness to say, how, how can I really read the signs of the times and divide the city and go where, where I'm needed or where our charism is needed. And I think there is movement and desire around you know, among newer members to have that kind of freedom and ability to, to say, you know, we're not as attached to geographic location, we're not as attached to um, a specific ministry, but really needing and wanting that space to, to go and follow where the Spirit leads and to be able to really live into um, our charism in the ways in which we feel the world is really calling us and challenging us to do. So um, I guess those are some of my thoughts and some of the fruits of conversations with my peers and um, some of the reflections on things that Mary Johnson was really bringing forward for us this morning. So thank you. And so on behalf of all of us, I'd, I'd like to say thank you for stretching us with your honesty and with your insights and your connections with what has been presented this morning. So thank you one more time. Okay, I'd like to suggest that we just take a stand-up break where you are while we're repositioning tables and people.